and we are live on Facebook. Okay, wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, those who are joining us either on the Zoom or on Facebook, I'm State Senator Shelley Mayer from the 37th Senate District in Westchester. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues from Westchester. I'm going to let them each say uh, a few words at the beginning. Uh, in this very important information se session about the Homeowner Assistance Fund. Now, before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping details. We do have a Spanish translators for this. Uh, Leby is our first one, and uh, you need to be on the Zoom to participate and listen to the translation in Spanish. So I will let Leby explain that, and then we'll be set to go. Thank you. Buenas noches, bienvenidos a la sesión de información del Fondo de Asistencia a Propietarios de Vivienda. Si ustedes quieren escuchar el seminario en español, lo único que tienen que hacer es en sus computadoras, seleccionen el icono de globo que aparece en la barra de abajo, seleccionen el globo y ahí pueden seleccionar español para escuchar el seminario en español simultáneamente. Gracias. Thank you so much. And also, I would point out that uh, if you're on the Zoom, you can get closed captioning as well, uh, which we always try to do so that everyone has access to these programs. This, this informational session is about the New York State Homeowner Assistance Fund, which was provided by federal funding in the American Rescue Plan that Congress adopted in March of 2021, almost a year ago. And this was to help New York and particularly New Yorkers, homeowners, owner occupied homeowners at risk of default, foreclosure and displacement as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you may know, working with our federal partners, the state legislature worked very hard to provide funding for rental tenants uh, to go to landlords to ensure that people could remain in their rental homes during COVID. This is a slightly different but similar in concept program for homeowners that own their own homes subject to a number of qualifying conditions in order to provide some funding and we'll hear about how much funding there is and how much funding we could use. But um, this program is open right now for applications. Uh, it's unclear how long it will be open. So this was an opportunity to make sure that people understood who was eligible how to proceed to apply, and the details of how the program works. So we have two experts on, uh, and I will introduce them shortly. But before that, let me introduce my partner and friend and our leader in the Senate, the majority leader of the New York State Senate uh, from Yonkers. That's great to hear. Um, my friend, the majority leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins. Thank you so much, Senator Mayor. It's always good to, to be with you, especially uh, when we can inform our constituents about how they can access some of this funds that the federal our federal partners made available to us. And I'm also happy to be joined with, and I know they'll all be saying a few words, but uh, my colleague, Senator Reichley Melnick, Senator Harkum, uh, and so many who are really trying to get the word out to say there's a limited amount of money and there's an opportunity. It's not just mortgages. It could be for, for a very property tax. It could be utilities. There's, there's a number of things that are addressed in this program. I also want to say just tooting our horns as a legislature, you know, the reason why we have this money now is because actually New York was the first to get these federal dollars. And we were the first to get the federal dollars because we in the legislature actually created a mechanism by which this money could flow once it became available. So we were ready to receive the funds and to make sure that they would be made available. We have a program in, in place. And so we were number one in the nation to get this money. So that means that we have an obligation to get it out fast and to make sure that people who need it know about it. And so this is why this forum is so important. So thank you. And of course, I want to thank uh, Dina Levy, uh, who will be presenting the senior VP of home. And I know you're going to introduce all these people and Jared Gilman as well, but I will 
let you do the introductions again. Good to be here with my colleagues and hopefully people will um, be able to benefit from this great program. Well, thank you, Majority Leader, for informing people don't really understand that the legislature has sort of has to do battle to get these funds during COVID and to get them in the right place. And we're very fortunate to be working now with Governor Hochul on a more rapid dispersal, dispersing of money and to have fantastic colleagues at the federal level. And yet our colleagues together made sure this happened. I want to point out, because I have so many co-op shareholders in my district, as does the majority leader, that this, this important program applies to co-op shareholders as well. And there's thousands of them in Westchester, and they're a very important part of our home ownership community. So with that, I want to introduce my friend and colleague from the northern part of Westchester, Senator Pete Harcum. Thank you so much, Senator Marin. And it's great to be with everyone this evening. And Senator Mayor, thank you and your amazing team for pulling this really important forum together. And Majority Leader, thank you for leading the fight. As Senator Mayor said, we really had to fight for these funds. Wanna thank um, our colleagues at HCR, uh, my former employer for a year, uh, for um, you know putting the program together. You know, it's one thing to fight for the money, but then we have to figure out a way to get it out the door. And it's all the dedicated folks over there and, and our partners at Legal Services of the Hudson Valley for all you do. And of course, my friend and, and, and colleague, uh, Senator Elijah Reichland Melnick. Um, the, the experts will tell you about the program. I, I wanna say just two things. The first is very important. You don't have to do this alone. Whenever there is something like an eviction or a foreclosure, the power that either the landlord or the bank normally has is that they have a lawyer and you don't. And we can write that equation. We put a lot of money in the budget to fund groups like legal services of the Hudson Valley. So if you are behind on your mortgage, if you're behind on your property taxes, you wanna participate in this program, or if you're just a renter who's listening in, I know this is devoted to foreclosure. It's the same thing. Please, please call Legal Services of the Hudson Valley and level the playing field. Lawyer up and, and all the stats show that when you have a lawyer talking to the, their lawyers, they are much more willing to settle than if they think they can just roll over you. The other thing I would suggest, as you will hear, the deadline is rapidly approaching. We have a very short window on this. It's February 4th, so please take action now. You'll learn all the details. They have great presentations for you this evening, but please don't hesitate, act immediately. So with that, thank you so much. Um, great to be here and back to you, Senator Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harkum, and, and thank you for making sure that, um, and I was gonna introduce Jared, but that we give credit to the legal services of the Hudson Valley, which is a partner to all of our offices on a myriad of issues, uh, particularly involving home uh, ownership with, or, or renters. And we've worked very closely with them on the ERAP program, uh, on all of the housing protection that we tried to build in during COVID. Thank you so much for your leadership on that. And they're one of a number of organizations, but they're here tonight and Jared will explain their role. So last but not least of our colleagues here tonight, Senator Elijah Reichland Melnick, who represents both Rockland and Westchester. He cuts over the Hudson. And uh, we'd love to hear a few words from you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Mayor, and thanks for, for working with our majority leader uh, to organize this. We have such a great uh, Senate delegation representing Westchester that I'm just honored to be part of. Um, and part of this important Zoom and important webinar to try to get some of this information out there to our constituents and to the public about this homeowner assistance fund, which is such a vital piece of our state's response to the crisis that has been brought on by COVID. Um, we're grateful to our federal partners who helped secure the funds for this and to HCR who is implementing it and, and all of the attorneys with legal services that are helping make homeowners aware of it. And we hope to as well. Um, there's been a lot of focus uh, rightly on the struggles that renters have been dealing with during this pandemic. Um, and they certainly have been, but we know in our communities that there are many homeowners who are struggling tremendously to make ends meet, to not fall too far behind, uh, to pay their property taxes, to pay their mortgage, to pay their condo charges. 
And we want to make sure that if you are in that boat, you know that there is a program available that may be able to help you. Um, and so if you're listening, if you're watching, whether it's this evening or later on, please consider taking advantage of this. It is so important. We want to make sure that nobody loses their home uh, in Westchester or in New York State who doesn't have to. And um, this is a kind of a program that can help. And uh, looking forward to hearing from the experts at HCR to, to tell us all about it. So thank you so much, Senator Reichland Melnick. And so we do have two experts. We have Dina Levy, who's a senior vice president for home ownership and community development at New York State Homes and Community Development. And if people don't know, that is an agency of the state government. It is a uh, agency that is directed by a commissioner who is appointed by the governor. And particularly with Governor Hochul, we've had a far better relationship in working, getting money out the door. And Adina is going to do a little presentation or a bigger presentation on the overview of the program and the types of assistance available. And then Jared Gilman, who's a staff attorney at Legal Services of the Hudson Valley, will go over the application process. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen if you're on the Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, put them in the Facebook uh, conversation. We are monitoring that and we will get them and I will go through them uh, after the presentation and we will try to answer all the questions. And I do wanna give a special thank you to Dina for her uh, persistence in, in making sure that we get the word out about this throughout the state because while we don't have unlimited funds and I think Dina will ex ex speak to that, um, it is quite important that what we got, we get out the door. The last thing we want is ha to have fought for this money and to have obtained this money and for it to sit in some account in Albany. So um, Dina, I will pass it on to you and then to Jared. And I see we already have one question in the chat and I will keep that uh, in mind for when we get further along. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and try to make it big so folks can see it. Um, I wanna thank everybody, uh, all of the members, Tonight for, for bringing this event together. Obviously, as everybody said, getting the word out is the chief uh, goal right now, and then moving the funds quickly simultaneously is the goal. So I'm going to go quickly through uh, an overview of the structure of the program and how one would apply and what you might need to know through the application process. And then we'll hear from Jared, and then we have plenty of time for everybody's questions. So as you heard, uh, these funds came from Congress, passed as part of the American Rescue Plan back in uh, March of 2021. The program at the federal level is overseen by the U.S. Department of Treasury. And we did have to submit a plan to Treasury and get their approval in order to go ahead and launch the program. That did take a bit of time. But as uh, Senator Mayer said, we were the first in the nation to get approval on her plan. So very proud of that. Um, as it was also mentioned, the funds are very specifically dedicated to helping homeowners who are at risk of uh, default, foreclosure, or displacement as a direct result of COVID. And the funds can attend to a number of different types of housing debt for homeowners. So uh, the ones I wanna mention in particular, obviously if you have a mortgage and you have fallen behind, whether you were in forbearance, meaning you temporarily paused your mortgage payments, or whether you're delinquent and for whatever reason never got into forbearance, it's also possible that folks might need something called a principal reduction. And that is for folks who have had uh, a curtailed income, right? So a loss of income as a result of COVID, and maybe could afford their mortgage when they uh, took it out some years ago, but as a result of COVID need a lower monthly payment, the funds can also help achieve a reduction in your monthly uh, mortgage payment by, by offering the bank something called a principal reduction. Uh, as mentioned also, it can address things like property taxes. So many homeowners may have been in their home a long time, no longer have a mortgage, but have fallen behind on their monthly property taxes or their utilities, things like water and sewer bills, which we know are also reasons where if you fall behind, you're at risk of foreclosure. The funds can also address those types of housing debt. Um, as mentioned, and this is something we've put a lot of attention to, if you are a co-op or a condo owner, whether you have a mortgage or not, if you've fallen behind on your monthly maintenance or HOA or carrying charges, you can apply for assistance just to get current on that, as well as your mortgage if you have one. And then lastly, I don't know how much of this we have in Westchester, but I know in Rockland, we probably have quite a few. 
Uh, if you are a manufactured homeowner, so you live in a manufactured home and that home is sited in a park um, or on privately owned land, you can get assistance if you have fallen behind on the debt you use to acquire that home, so sometimes called a chattel loan, or if you are paying a monthly lot rent because you site your home in a park, you can apply for assistance to get current on your monthly lot rent. Um, as was mentioned, we opened the application period on January 3rd um, and have been getting quite a number of applications. I do want to correct one thing. Um, we are not uh, yet, we have not determined to close the application window on February 4th. So that was the earliest date we would have potentially closed. We wanted to make sure we were open at a minimum of 30 days. Based on where we are today, I think we will stay open beyond that date. But whenever we are preparing to close the application portal, we will provide at least two weeks notice to the public and to all of our elected uh, partners to make sure folks know in advance if there is a, a closing date looming. Uh, a couple of rules that are important to know. So you must be a New York State homeowner. And I think it was mentioned, you must use that home as your primary residence. Generally speaking, primary residence means the place that you return to most of the time, right? Where you live most of the year. Um, under the federal rules, you have to have endured something called a, uh, a COVID-related financial hardship. That has a technical definition, but it basically means that you have had a meaningful reduction in your monthly income or annual income or a meaningful increase in your living expenses. Under this program, we are not asking uh, applicants to upload documents proving their hardship, but there will be uh, what we call an attestation or basically like a letter of truthfulness that you will sign to attest to the fact that you have endured a financial hardship as a result of COVID. Generally speaking, you must be behind on your monthly housing payments and the time of application. There are two exceptions to that, um, which we did have to seek approval from Treasury for and which we got, which I will cover in just a minute. So by and large, you should be behind on some type of monthly housing costs, kinds we covered already, um, with two exceptions, which I'll give it, uh, get into in just a minute. And then one of the most important um, rules under the program is the income eligibility. So to be eligible for New York State half funds, you have to earn equal to or less than 100% of something called the area median income. AMI is a technical definition that's set by the federal government. A different agency sets that called HUD. Uh, basically, it looks at what is the average income in a particular county. We do have on our website an income chart. So AMI is, is structured both by what county you live in and then how many members live in your household. Uh, if you go to our website, and I'll talk more about the website in a minute, uh, there is an, uh, an AMI chart so that you can look up your family size by whatever county you live in and determine whether or not you think you meet the income eligibility. For examples, I've given what it looks like for Westchester households, 100% of the AMI for a, a single person household is just over 89,000. A two person household is 102,000 and a three person household is $114,750. Again, there's a chart on our website so you can look up your family size in your county and know whether or not you will meet our income requirements. In terms of organization of the program, I do wanna mention some important partnerships that we have. The first is an organization called Sustainable Neighborhoods, LLC. We do have a representative, Kevin Wolf from, from Sustainable Neighborhoods with us tonight. Uh, this is a not-for-profit organization that we um, identified through a competitive request for applications. They have been around for uh, over 15 years, and they really have existed historically to do nothing but this type of work. So their entire mission is dedicated to keeping homeowners in their home, preventing foreclosures, um, and we are very lucky to have them as operational partners. So they are managing case management, the call center, and the day-to-day -day operations of the program under HCR's direction. Very importantly, we've also built out a partnership with the New York State Attorney General's Office. So Letitia James, our Attorney General, has a large operation already that um, called their Mortgage Enforcement Unit. And, and this um, is really important for the HALF program. So uh, in addition to HALF, uh, under a number of different federal rules and regulations, banks and mortgage companies are required to offer borrowers relief as a result of COVID. So they call these loan modifications, sometimes they call it loss mitigation, but there are a number of federal requirements 
that banks and mortgage companies are required to offer homeowners. We are working very closely through the Attorney General's office to make sure that when somebody applies for our program for half, that in addition to providing whatever funding you might need, we are also making sure that your bank has provided you all that you're entitled to in terms of relief from COVID. This is very important because it will also enable us to help a lot more homeowners across the state of New York. So we are very grateful to Attorney General James for their partnership. And then lastly, um, we have built out this relationship with over 70 not-for-profit housing counseling and legal services organizations, including legal services of the Hudson Valley, and we'll hear from Jared in a little bit. Um, this network, which has been operational since 2012, sometimes called the HOP Network or the Homeowner Protection Program Network. Again, these are free, not-for-profit services offered to homeowners. They can represent you in court if you are facing legal action. They can help do an analysis of your mortgage and whether your bank has offered you what you're entitled to. They also, under our program, have the ability to make applications directly into the system on behalf of homeowners. And they have unlimited numbers, so they have their own credentials. So any lawyer or, or housing counseling agency connected to this program can take in clients and then actually submit applications on their client's behalf. They are also serving as a referral network the other way. So if we do get an applicant who's working on their own, and, and to the comments we heard from Senator Harcum earlier, and we do see that you're in litigation or you need legal assistance, we will make a referral to the uh, partner, the hot partner closest to you. We also have a tool on our website. If you just click on get local support, you can put in your zip code and you will see all of the hop organizations that are operating and serving your zip code. In terms of how much funding is available and what the different uh, interventions are. So there is a cap per application, which is basically a household cap of $50,000. So this is based a little bit on historically looking at what, his, what programs in the past needed in order to get most uh, homeowners current on their housing debt. It also is based on what we think is the average uh, amount of delinquency as a result of COVID. You can apply for more than one of these applications or sorry, these interventions through one application and you can mix and match them. Uh, but the total combined award to any individual household is capped at $50,000. So the first intervention we call our mortgage reinstatement or principal reduction program. This is the one that is largely directed to homeowners who have a mortgage. And again, they may need relief catching up on missed payments or they may need a principal reduction in order to reduce their monthly payments. Um, and so that is the, the purpose of the, of the mortgage reinstatement principal reduction program. Second program, arrear satisfaction is virtually for all other types of housing. So whether you're uh, a co-op or condo owner who's fallen behind on your HOA or maintenance fees, or if you're a manufactured homeowner uh, who's fallen behind on your home loan or your monthly lot rents, uh, or if you're a homeowner who's fallen behind on property taxes or water or sewage bills, you would apply for this um, intervention. And the goal here is, again, to catch people up on whatever missed payments they have and make sure they come out the other side stable and current on their housing payments. Uh, the last one we call forward payments, and this is um, for a sort of modified version of applicants. Uh, this is if you are currently unemployed or have exhausted your unemployment benefits uh, and you cannot afford to make your forward payments, meaning it's not just that you have debt that you missed or back payments that you owe, but you won't be able to keep making your mortgage payments or your taxes or your co-op payments going forward. If you are unemployed or have exhausted your unemployment benefits, we can review you for forward payments. As I said earlier, all of these interventions can be used together, so you don't have to just pick one. If you are a, so, as an example, if you are a co-op owner who has a mortgage that you use to buy your shares, right, your share loan, uh, and you've fallen behind on that mortgage, but you also have fallen behind on your monthly HOA or maintenance fees, you can apply for relief with one application for both the mortgage relief and for the HOA arrear satisfaction program. But again, the combined award cannot exceed $50,000. I mentioned earlier, there are two exceptions to needing to be delinquent at the time of application. We did have to go to treasury and seek approval for this. So if you are a mortgage borrower who got a loan modification since COVID occurred, so basically since January of 2020, but you are struggling to stay current on that mortgage modification, you should still apply to half. 
and we will consider whether we can either improve upon your modification, again, through our partnership with the Attorney General's office, through negotiating directly with your bank, or if we need to, to provide a principal reduction in order to lower your monthly payments. The other instance in where you don't necessarily need to be delinquent is if you have managed to stay current on your housing debt, but you are unemployed, or you have exhausted your unemployment benefits, you can apply uh, to the program for the forward payment program. And again, these were exceptions that we had to request from Treasury, but they were ultimately granted. And so uh, those are our two exceptions. So uh, what happens when you get a, uh, an award under the program? We've gotten a lot of questions from folks about, is it a grant? Is it a loan? Do you have to pay it back? How does that work? So what I would call this is basically a forgivable grant program. So when you apply and are awarded funds under half, you will sign a grant agreement with the Sustainable Neighborhoods, the nonprofit organization that's helping administer the program. It's also called a promissory note. Um, and basically what it says is if you remain in the home for five years without a resale of the home or without a refinance at the end of the five years, those funds are fully forgiven. So it's a complete grant. You don't owe anything back. You don't have to pay anything. During the term of the five years, there are no payments. You don't have to pay anything. The goal is just to make sure that folks are staying in the home as a result of the half intervention. Um, similarly, uh, there is one other rule that I think is important to note here is before getting a half award, we do need to determine that the applicant has not received funding from another state or federal program, which is often called duplication of benefits. So for instance, you may be a homeowner who has a renter or a couple renters, right? If you have a two or three family home, you may have applied for and received funding under the ERAP program. So the state's emergency rent program, you are still eligible to apply for half, but we would need to make sure that if you've got an award under the ERAP program, that what you're applying for under the half program is not the exact same funding, right? So we're not paying double for the same housing debt. Again, if you were confused about this or if you did get assistance under another program and you want to know if you're eligible, I'd highly recommend that you apply and we will work through that process with you. Um, the last thing I wanna say, and we did just get word on, uh, from Treasury on this, is we've gotten a lot of questions about whether or not there is any tax consequence to homeowners as a result of being awarded funds under half. The answer is there is not. So you will not be taxed on your annual income uh, taxes as a result of getting a benefit from half. In terms of the application, I do wanna say we have worked very hard to simplify the application. We did learn some lessons from programs that went before us about you know, what to do right, better. Um, and so we have done really, and I think we've done very well based on the number of applications we've gotten, folks are navigating this largely by themselves we have really simplified the application. So it is a web-based portal. <clears throat> there are roughly um, six sections to the application. They are all relatively short. The first is just a basic pre-qualification. So this is just six or seven questions, or maybe it's eight questions, where we're just trying to determine if you meet the basic eligibility, so that you're a New York homeowner, that you live there as your primary residence, that you're attesting to the COVID impact, once you've gotten through those pre-qualification questions, you will be asked to click on a secure link um, that'll come through your email account. And there you will then use that link to set up a credential for yourself, a password using your email. Please hang on to your password in case you need to pause your application and come back. Um, it's very simple. The registration will just ask some personal information about yourself or if anybody's assisting you with the application, we will wanna capture their information. There is some basic demographic information. You are not obligated to fill this information out, but we are urging people to please, if they're comfortable, share that information with us. Um, then there will be a few questions about your income and your household information, um, and then your housing costs, which is really the place where we're understanding what you are struggling to either pay or catch up on or stay current on. Um, and then the last are the attestations. And again, I mentioned these are statements of fact that you're signing and you don't have to print anything. You can sign it right in, in the application itself. Um, that just you know, tells us that what the information you've given us is truthful. Again, that you've had a COVID impact, that you are in fact using your home as your primary residence. Um, and then your application will have been submitted. In terms of documents, and I know this has been a big question, what will you have to upload? What documents will you need? Here again, we have gone to great lengths to minimize the number of documents that you need to upload as part of this process. 
We do that using a series of what we call third-party verification services, which are all live and active in the application itself. So if an applicant is willing to share certain information with us, some cases that's a birthday, in some cases, if they're able and willing, they, we ask for uh, social security information, but where you are willing to provide us with certain data points, we are able to automatically look you up through this live third-party verification and really minimize the number of documents you need to upload. So for instance, there are kind of four areas. One is we're looking for proof of, proof of ownership. Again, here, if you provide us with your birth date and your address, we can look that up automatically. That has been very successful. 95% of the applicants have qualified for proof of ownership without having to upload any document. Proof of identity, similarly, there is a system we've hooked up to called Precise ID. So if you grant us permission to look you up in Precise ID, we don't need you to upload any information verifying that you are who you say you are. So no driver's license or passport or social security card or anything. Uh, income documentation here too, we've figured out a mechanism to use a proxy. So if you are willing to provide, and we understand not everybody can or will want to provide this, so it's your choice. But if you do provide us with social security information for you and the other adult members of your household, we automatically look up your household income using Department of Labor data. And this has also saved people a lot of time not having to upload. It's a little bit complicated income documentation. So many, many people are getting through by just providing a social security and letting us do the automated lookup for income. The last one, there is no workaround. So no matter what, you will have to upload at least one document and that is proof of housing delinquency. So if you are behind on HOA, taxes, water, sewage, mortgage, that's not something we can verify without your assistance. And we will need you to upload a document showing that you owe um, a third party some type of housing debt. Okay, in terms of applying, just quickly, I can run through this. So I've mentioned already the online portal. That is what I just described. We are um, operating in 10 languages and that's not through Google Translate, another lesson learned. We did natural translations into 10 languages. So the portal operates in 10 natural languages. Um, again, we've made it as easy as possible. And other big lesson, if you need to step away and save your work, not a problem, right? You just hit save, you can close the window, can log back in using your credentials that you set up and come back at any time. Um, there is a 30 day window with which we ask folks once you start an application to, to complete it. And you are reminded of that throughout the application. Uh, the last thing is I'll just say the documents that you do need to upload, you can do in any number of different like attachments. So it can be a, a Word document, a PDF, you can take a photo on your cell phone and upload it as a picture. You've made the upload uh, piece, I think, fairly easy. So despite all of that, we do understand that some people won't feel comfortable applying over the internet. Some people don't have access to high-speed technology. Some people just aren't comfortable. So we have also created a live operator call center that is also operating in 10 languages, plus a translation service if there's any language that we're not covering. For those who are just not comfortable applying online, you can call the call center. They are open Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And there you can talk to a live operator in your chosen language, and they will actually submit the application over the phone for you. There will be a requirement to get those documents that we need, and they will coach you through that. In the worst case scenario, we will allow for mailed in documents. So we are trying to find other ways to make it easier for people to get the documents in quickly. But again, anybody who's not comfortable applying online can do so over the phone. And then the third way to apply, which I've already touched on, is through this network of housing counseling and legal service partners. Again, we'll hear from um, Jared at, at uh, Legal Services of the Hudson Valley in a minute, but we have these over, I think it's 75 organizations functioning across the state. Um, and if you connect to one of them and sign up, they can actually submit an application for you on your behalf, and then also track the progress of the application all the way through to final award. Um, the other thing I should say is, if you are working with somebody who is not a HAP counselor, but let's say you have a nephew or a niece or a daughter or a neighbor or a coworker who is more comfortable using the internet, you can also work with any individual of your choosing to have them apply on your behalf. We call that like an advocate application. Um, in that case, we will ask for both your advocate's contact information and the homeowner's information, and then communicate to both of you throughout the life of the application. That is it. So this is the website where you should go. It is www 
www.nyhomeownerfund.org. In addition to starting an application at that website, it is where you can do the lookup for the uh, um, income chart that I mentioned at the top of the presentation, right? So there's like very easy links to find that. There's also where you can go to get local support and put in your zip code and find one of our hot partners, that free housing counseling and legal service providers. And then there's a ton of additional information, again, all in 10 languages that you might find useful. There is an application guide, which just walks you through step-by-step step everything you'll be asked, a reminder of the documents that you may need to upload it, that we just covered in our document checklist, um, and then frequently asked questions, including things like, how does one file an appeal? How long should an application take? And so forth. Our call center, again, where I mentioned you can call just to ask questions, or if you want to submit an application over the phone, is 844-776-9423. That number again is 844-77-NY-HALF or 776-9423. And with that, I will turn it over to Jared to talk about uh, HALF. Okay, Hello, Jared. Everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so please let me know if you're not able to view that. Um, all right, so I do want to let you know that I'm a person who stutters, so you may hear some pauses or interruptions in my, my speech as we, we, we go along here. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about legal services of the, the, the Hudson Valley and some of the issues that we can help with. Um, so um, we are a non-profit law firm and our mission is to provide free high quality counsel in civil matters for individuals and for families who cannot afford to pay an attorney when their basic human needs or at the date. And to go on to the uh, next slide here, just give me one moment to do that. Okay. Sorry, are you, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Are you still able to see the, the yes. screen or not able to yes. see it? Yes, number three, slide three, we see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so the, the foreclosure prevention services that we offer are part of the New York Homeownership Protection Program. Um, and um, we, we handle mortgage and reverse mortgage foreclosures. Um, we also handle property tax and school tax foreclosures, um, as well as um, foreclosures related to um, non-payment of common ch charges when there's a uh, homeowners association involved. And we offer the full range of legal services. So anything from legal advice and counsel to a assistance with preparing court paperwork uh, to negotiation and to representation in court. Um, and we do work with um, other HOP network partners, such as HUD approved housing counseling agencies. Um, and they often help with the, um, with the application for a modification of a mortgage. And they're, they're very helpful in submitting those applications and doing other negotiation with 
um, the mortgage companies to try to um, avoid a foreclosure. Um, so I thought next we would talk a bit about the process for a foreclosure, just so that you have some context for how um, half and the services that we offer can fit can fit in in here. Um, okay, so it should be on the next slide that says mortgage foreclosure process on top. I hope that is showing that. Um, and um, the um, so the process for a foreclosure of a mortgage st starts with a pre-foreclosure notice, at least 90 days prior to a court case being able to be st started. Uh, in this notice, um, it explains, it, it's from the mortgage company and explains that you might be at risk of foreclosure and provide some inf information about that. Um, the um, next thing that would happen would be that you uh, would be served with a summons and complaint for uh, a court case. Um, and then the first part of the court process is, is what's called the foreclosure settlement conferences. Um, and it's in, in um, these conferences that um, you're able to apply for some kind of a um, modification of the mortgage or other uh, option to try to avoid a foreclosure and be able to retain your, your home. Um, and the good thing about this process is that the court makes sure that there is an application submitted and that the mortgage company gives a response to the application. Um, and all of that needs to happen prior to any actual activity to move ahead with the, the foreclosure can happen. So there's a pause during those, the, those conferences. Um, next would be the, the litigation process where the mortgage company would try to have the court approve the, the foreclosure and a homeowner can um, raise any legal issues to try to oppose the foreclosure. Uh, the end of the foreclosure process would be uh, the foreclosure auction, uh, which could also also called the foreclosure fail. Um, and then the eviction process would happen after that. Uh, so in terms of when to contact uh, uh, legal services, you can contact us anytime that uh, you as a homeowner are behind on your housing payments. There does not need to be a court case for you to, for you to, to, to contact us. Um, usually it is good to contact us as early as possible so that you can access information and help early and hopefully there's less money owed at that point as well. Um, but even if you have a case in court that is far along, you should, you should contact us also uh, because there could be legal options available to avoid the, the, the foreclosure even later on in the process. Um, some of the common things that we help with um, would be answering the complaint, which is the, the, legal, the legal answer that you would need to put in in order to oppose the case, um, reviewing loan modification offers, um, and providing legal advice on them, um, as well as handling legal issues that arise in court. So there could be a legal issue in the settlement conference part um, if the mortgage company is saying that you are not eligible for a modification, we can look and see if that is the, the correct response or not. Um, and in litigation, there could be issues related to whether the, uh, the pre-foreclosure notices were done in the proper way um, and whether the party that's bringing the case is the, the proper party to, to bring the case. Um, and so... Um, I hope that that is some, some useful context for all of this. Um, I do have on this slide that hopefully you can see our intake phone number. Um, so if you are looking for help from uh, our agency, you should, uh, you should call us uh, at this number, um, 
5748529. Um, and our website also is here at lshd.org. Um, so I'm going to leave it to um, leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you so very much. And, and thank you, Dina, for, uh, you know, I know for us senators, hearing you having improved the process so measurably uh, from the experience of the person who uses it, which is one of our frustrations. Thank you very much for doing all of that, you know, having real language, not using a um, you know, the online or whatever, the translator system, having real, uh, all of these things that you did that really make it easier. Thank you. Now we have a, a number of questions. I will start, uh, put your questions in the Q&A, but uh, are the municipal tax collectors directing residents in arrears to this financial relief and legal services? Dina, can you answer that or? I can, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we have done probably, for trainings for um, the finance departments and the uh, leadership of most of the counties across the state. We reached out very early on to the New York State Association of Counties to get like a comprehensive list uh, to make sure that, that the tax collectors knew the program was coming. And then once we opened that the application window was open, um, we are getting good feedback from them on this and, and, and do know that in many cases they are not only um, aware of the program, but are actually including as the foreclosure moratorium has lifted and some of the in rem foreclosures, meaning the tax foreclosures around the state have picked back up that the, um, I just got a call from actually the town of Newburgh. Uh, they are um, notifying um, uh, folks who are being told that they may be headed into a, a property tax foreclosure about half and how to reach us. Um, and we've also, um, a complete list from the New York Association of Counties of all of the current day, by, you know, people change jobs over time. So we wanted to get the most current list of finance directors for all of the counties. We do have that list. We've been emailing them flyers about the program. And also we have to validate with them when we do have an applicant who's seeking funds, we validate with them, you know, that the debt is owed before we make the final payment. So um, they're very aware of it. If, if you think we have missed somebody or that we need to reach out, we are happy to keep doing that, um, but we have spent a lot of time to make sure that the, that they're aware of the program. But if there are, uh, there are some municipal officials here I see on, and, and they represent towns and villages. Um, can they reach out directly to you, Dina, or someone? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I can put my contact in the chat um, yes. and, and folks can reach out if, if you think somehow we've missed you. We're happy to catch up and make sure you have all of our materials. This is a very good question. There are two mortgages on our house. Only one was able to be paid, the larger one. The smaller amount of a little over 500 hasn't been paid in almost two years with my husband out of work. Because we are not currently at risk for foreclosure, does that exclude us? No, it does not. So if you are struggling to stay current on your mortgage, whether it's a first mortgage or a second mortgage, um, or if you're already behind on that second mortgage, you do not need to be in active litigation in order to apply for the program. In other words, do not wait for foreclosure to begin in order to apply for the program. We are prioritizing the one place where we've created a prioritization and just making sure applications are moving quickly is anybody who is in active litigation, primarily because we want to make sure we get them legal representation through groups like Jared's, right, Legal Services of Hudson Valley. But uh, waiting for foreclosure is not the right option. So if you are struggling, if you are unsure if you're qualified, if you just know that you have a debt that like is two years delinquent, do not wait, apply uh, tonight. Go to the website and start applying. Um, an another, this is not a question, but from um, Kathy at uh, HDSW uh, in my district, Human Development Services of Westchester, which is a hot partner you know, in places where uh, people have a relationship with a, a not-for-profit like HDSW, um, they can go to them and they can actually do this paper, this uh, online entry of the data because many of our constituents either don't have computer uh, mm -hmm. capability or they're not sure. used to it. And Jared, do you, do you help people actually fill out the application? So yes, they, they can go to, uh, our um, 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 agencies and um, my colleagues, you know, are are helping with these with these applications. You know, sometimes we might 
think that um, the, the housing agency is the more appropriate um, agency, usually if there's a mortgage involved um, and there needs to be a modification application put in as well, um, it might make more sense for the housing agency to do it. Um, if there is not a mortgage involved, it might it would make more sense for my agency to, to do it. But you know, the short answer is yes, we're, we're able to help with these applications. And I think especially for someone who's, who is having a hard time doing it online, you know, accessing it for those, for those reasons, you know, we are available as a resource to, to actually um, put in the application. Okay. I had a question, uh, there's more questions, but on water or sewage bills, how, um, do the companies or whoever you're, let's say you're, you provide to a private water company or you provide to a municipal water company, are they notifying people when they're behind on the bills that this program is available or do you not, does, do you know, Dina? I, I don't know for sure how that works across because there are a lot of different municipalities and different right collectors. And again, we, we did do much like I just mentioned with the, uh, the Association of Counties, we did the same thing for the Association of Mayors. Right, so we did multiple presentations leading into the opening to make sure that all of the mayors statewide who participate, which is a lot of them, uh, were aware of this. Um, I do believe in many cases, water and tax, I'm sorry, water and sewage delinquencies get rolled into a, a singular tax bill, not always. Again, there's 63 you know, counties and countless, countless municipalities. But by and large, we have been tending to see applications in where the delinquency for the utilities, so water and sewage, are rolled into the tax mm -hmm. um, notification. Uh, and so again, we're you know if it's not, we can address it through. We can cut as many checks as we need to. In other words, if somebody's like behind and they have three different payees, we can absolutely work with that uh, applicant and they cut the check to the appropriate third party. Often, we're seeing that it's all rolled into one uh, bill that we're we're generally uh, preparing to set. Okay, here's a question from Facebook. What happens if a homeowner didn't go into forbearance and use savings to pay their mortgage? There were no mentions of financial assistance for homeowners during the beginning of COVID. So not knowing these programs were on the horizon and not wanting to ruin credit, uh, they use their savings to keep all home expenses mm. current. I think we all saw that with our constituents who were nervous about their credit rating if they had savings. What is the story with someone in, in that situation? Yeah, so uh, it's a little hard to do these like uh, in these forums to do like an individual counseling session. But let me say this at a sort of a high level. Uh, it was a treasurer requirement that you had to be delinquent. So that was not a decision that New York State made. That was a requirement, I think, both under the federal law and then under the rules that uh, U.S. Treasury put out for the program. As I mentioned, we did seek two exceptions, recognizing that some people really struggled to stay current and are now struggling even worse because of it. Um, what I would recommend in this, in this um, person's case who, who asked the question is that you go ahead and apply to the program. We will then work with you to try to figure out what, what is available, whether that's additional mortgage assistance through our partnership with the Attorney General's office, or whether there is an exception for half funding depending on your current income or circumstance. Um, but I would strongly recommend Again, it's hard because you have, I have to ask a lot of questions to get to the right answer. I would strongly recommend that you apply. And, and then as you work through the program, we will see if there are uh, resources that we can bring to bear, whether those are half and or mortgage relief through the AG partnership. Good, okay. I'll keep going here. Did I understand that the applications will only be accepted until February 4th? I know you answered this, but could you answer it again? It's quite important. Yeah, I'm sorry. I realize this is confusing to people because it's hard to not know for certain when something is beginning and when it's ending. Um, <laughs> it, what we said was, right, when we launched that we would in no circumstance close the application window in less than 30 days. We launched on January 3rd. So a lot of people have interpreted that to mean that we are automatically closing on February 4th, which is 30 days. Uh, we are we are not uh, at the point where we have determined that we need to close on the fourth, um, and and just at a very high level, you know, we are just tracking to make sure that we are not oversubscribed. What we don't want is homeowners applying and then thinking they're in line for something and then finding out there's no resources. What I can say is, before we close the portal, we will give at least two weeks' notice to the public to the elected officials that a closing date is, has been determined. So at the moment, we have not announced one. You should not assume that it is closing on a particular date. When we get to the point where that we do need to announce it, we will give two weeks notice. So we will make sure that both on the website, 
in our public marketing, I, I didn't really get to mention this, but we also have 23 not-for-profits that we've onboarded as partners who are doing like boots on the ground outreach at the community level, making sure the word is getting out, particularly to homeowners who are harder to reach. And we also have a paid marketing campaign that we're doing through a professional media company, television, radio, social media, direct mailers. All of that will be uh, updated when we've decided that we are two weeks out from closing. So folks will know. What I would say though, to Senator Mayer's earlier point is the resources, even though it sounds big, are not unlimited. And we are worried that the need could outweigh the resources that we have. So we would urge you not wait, apply, especially like to the question earlier, do, there's no reason to wait. You should apply now. Um, we are getting a lot, a lot of applications uh, and we wanna make sure we're getting to folks who really need the, the assistance. So I would strongly urge you to not wait and apply. Jared, feel free to jump in if there's something additional to be said here. Does this apply in case a two family house is owned by a small business, single owner who lives there. I think many of us have these small businesses in a home situation. So yeah, so again, it's a little bit of a complicated question. You can live in a one to four unit single family home. So if, if you have say a three or a two unit home, um, as long as you occupy one of those units and own the home and occupy one of those units as your primary residence, you can apply, including if you are in trouble or falling behind on your housing payments because, say, your renter isn't able to pay you, right? The only condition on that is what I mentioned earlier, where we have to make sure that we haven't, sorry, that the applicant hasn't already received funding under another state or federal program, including ERAP. But as long as you occupy one of the units, own the home, and treat that unit as your primary residence, one to four unit homes, so one family, a two family, a three family, a four family, as well as co-ops, condos, are all eligible to apply. Okay. One question here that I don't think you mentioned. Is it accurate that the applicant selects which year's income to use for eligibility? Or no, that's it not accurate. What is it? So, yeah. So if you're using the proxy, meaning this, this um, third party verification that we've set up so that you don't need to upload income documents, we are taking social security numbers for the adult members of your household and then multiple times a day running it against Department of Labor data that tells us your current wage income for basically the last 12 months. And if you are as a, as a household, your wage income, according to the DOL, says that you're less than 100 percent of the area median income then you automatically qualify without uploading any income documents. If you don't want to provide that or can't provide that information and do need to upload documents, we are looking for your most current statement of income. So basically the last 12 months. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, a few months ago, my neighbor was able to obtain a loan modification from the bank that holds her home mortgage and she's current on her mortgage. However, rather than have a 30 year mortgage, she now has a 40 year mortgage. Would she be able to apply for assistance with the goal of obtaining a 30 year mortgage rather than a 40 year mortgage? And you again, very difficult to do without like a, a dialogue. What yeah. I can say is one of the offers that the federal government is requiring banks to offer to homeowners is a mortgage extension. So, right, one way to bring down a monthly housing payment is to take a 30 year loan or what was originated as a 30 year loan and extend it out 10 years. I you are not necessarily obligated to take that. But if it does make the mortgage more affordable to you, in many cases, this will be a, a, a like a great benefit for homeowners. Now, I understand people don't want to be in debt, but you can always refinance down the line. You don't have to stay in that mortgage for 40 years. So what I would say in this case, again, is I think you should apply if there is concern or you should recommend that your neighbor apply if there is concern that like maybe you got into the wrong modification. And again, the only assistance available under half is not just cash, right? We have this really important partnership with the attorney general's office where we are individually going to your banks and making sure that they are they are behaving well, right? And that they are offering everybody what they're entitled to and that if there are issues with um, what they've offered or what they haven't offered, that we are making sure that that is part of the solution that is being offered here. So if there's confusion, the other thing I would say is HOP is, is extremely well-skilled, right? Jared's group probably deals with this kind of question all the time. And so if you don't wanna go through an application, but you wanna get connected to the legal services of the Hudson Valley or another HOP organization, you can go to our website, nyhomeownerfund.org, get local support, put in your zip code and find the groups who can help you do the analysis anymore. Right, and I think 
I think if the, the payment is high, that's a, no, a good reason to apply, right? And see if see if there's something where you know the, the modified payment was not the, the right one or, or something like like that. Um, because half will look will look at you know what the the, per, the the percentage is of that payment compared to your income. So if it's if it's high, that's a good reason to apply for a half. Um, and yes, the the other part is that. Um, my agency can certainly look at these modifications and just be able to explain them, see if they are following the rules that apply to them, if, if there are rules that ap ap apply to that, that modification. So I'm going to uh, close it out here. The, some questions were answered previously, which I totally understand. It's a lot of information. You can call the number that Dina put in her presentation uh, where there is, information available. Um, I'm, I think I'll stop. There's some really good individual questions. Lots of people really are interested. We've had an excellent participation in this program. And I can't thank you, Dina and Jared, enough uh, for really such a substantive presentation. Excellent. And really giving the details of what our constituents can and, and can't do. And you know, the limitations, as you said, would potentially, there is not enough money, but right now is an opportunity to apply and you should take advantage of it if you think you're eligible. And I do want to thank my, certainly the majority leader for hanging in here for the whole hour and uh, Senator Harkiman and Senator Reichlin Melnick, Senator Andre Stewart Cousins, would you like to say something in closing? And I just, I, Oh, am I on? Yeah, on. I, I <laughs> no. Well, thank you again, uh, Senator Mayor, for making sure that people understand what is available, highlighting and spotlighting not only state and uh, state agencies that are doing this work, but our local agencies that are also helping. I think the last thing I would say and can't be said enough, if you are in trouble, apply. If you're not in trouble and you think you can get help, apply because sometimes people are too embarrassed or they're, please don't risk losing your home. Please apply and let us work with you from there. So I also wanna thank Dina and Jared for excellent presentations. Yeah, excellent, thank you. And um, I do wanna thank uh, our two translators here, Leby Diaz and Patty Alcivar. Uh, I want to thank my staff, which helped put this together, Emily Lavin, Marian Joyce and Rachel Estroff. All the other, uh, my colleagues, Senator Harkum and Senator Reichland Melnick, and uh, really all of the participants. And uh, I think this will be recorded, am I correct? Uh, and will be available later so that we will be able to go back. And particularly for our local towns and villages where I think a point was well made that we wanna make sure that they know about it as well and can be as helpful to their constituents. But with all that, thank you so much. Thank you for this great information a wonderful program. Thank you that uh, to our federal partners and to the state for, for making it happen. Thank you to my colleagues in the legislature for finding the path to get this money out the door. So with that, thank you all. Did I leave anyone out? I, I don't think so. Good night and thank you for having us. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.